You can always say no comment, Gina. <laughs> say no comment. <laughs> what people do is they say, um, do you think you could make the answer slightly shorter? Because we're going to run out of time. I'm 103 years old and um, I come from Mars. And um, no, I'm, I'm Gina Birch and I have just got a new record out. I was in a band called The Raincoats, and uh, now I've made my first solo album as Gina Birch, and I'm really happy to be here. And uh, I'm also a painter, and I, Sharon and I have had a bit of a collaboration up front. Um, anyway, I'll shut up. <laughs> um, my name is Sharon Van Etten, and I... I write songs and have a band, but I am a fan of Gina and I feel lucky enough to call her a friend. And and we have just collaborated on a book together that I'm so excited about. And I am excited for your new record, Gina. It is so good. <laughs> Amazing. Well, that's a very lovely thing to hear you say, Sharon, because you're amazing. <laughs> Um, well, well, I knew your music before I ever met you and, but I believe the first time we met was when I came through on a press tour in about 2011 and, and, uh, your partner, Mike Holdsworth, uh, is my, my project manager at Secretly Canadian and he would always host me, uh, whenever I came over and you both would host an amazing meal and amazing conversation where i went home and i would research half the things you talked about because it was so compelling and i was just very moved by how open you were as an artist and as a parent and um just how you both connect with each other and still have so much passion in the music industry at, you know for living in a city that could, you know, you could easily be jaded, but there is always so much passion and joy that you, you have in, in your lives that was very inspiring to me as a, a young musician. <laughs> well, that's lovely to hear. I mean, Mike is amazing in, in, as, as a cook, a chef, and he's very interested in food and wine and cooks all sorts of interesting things. I'm much more, I'm, I, I, I'm like a speed cook, so, you know, you don't really want to come for dinner when I'm cooking, but uh, it's lovely when Mike's cooking. Um, yes, it was amazing, uh, uh, you know, when, when you came round and you were just so beautiful and funny and lovely and warm and, you know, it was just great to meet you and then hearing your music and so it was, it was lovely. And and then, you know, when when I found out you were pregnant i mean that was just like whoa hey you know I, I it's it was uh that was a very special we were in we were in new york weren't we we were in new york when that happened and we did a photo and stuff yeah you know sharon my daughter's honey and Layla. i'm sure we will talk about uh things to do with those uh lovely offsprings that we have uh yeah honey is my older daughter and Layla the younger I have so many questions and I'm trying to figure out how to tie it in. But since we're talking about families, I have been curious since, you know, raising two daughters, um, how has that changed, if at all, your creative process? And has it changed what you want to write about or the the subject matter that you either want to create in in your in your painting world and also has it inspired you more in your songwriting um, as you've evolved? It's funny, really, because um, when the kids were small, I, I wasn't really thinking about, I mean, I've never really thought about a career. I, I, I started in the 70s, and in the 70s, you know, career and money was kind of a bit of a dirty word. We thought, we thought oh, that's, you know, it's like, I, you know, but I'm, you know, fortunately, we could all live for free. You know, living in squats, we we uh, 
food was very cheap. We we didn't really have have big bills to pay. So we just we could be creative without worrying about where the where the money was coming from. So yeah, I I I what when when I had um children, I didn't really kind of continue as a musician as such. What I did was I kind of integrated you know, I became like um, a nursery school teacher, or a, I just had lots of fun with with them when they were small, and and that's what I did. It was like full time. I was like a full time entertainer, but you know, in in in, you know, I have to say that they were so entertaining back. That was a really kind of mutual fun thing. We did lots of storytelling and painting and singing and you know, you know, till 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 um I think it was when when maybe Honey was about nine or ten and I went and played my first show. Somebody asked me to go and do a solo show, and I was suddenly like went back out into the world and I was like, oh. <laughs> You know, suddenly somebody somebody at the show said, "I've come down from Manchester to see you," and I was like, "You're kidding me!" Because I forgot that I'd, you know, been in some cult band or something. You know, I I just thought I I I was just a mum by then. You know, and I I I really loved being a mum. I was because I was quite old by the time I did finally become a mum. It was like it was like what I'd really wanted to do. Yeah, so so yeah, be, being a mom um, didn't really impinge on my uh, creative process, uh, and 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 oh, actually, that's a lie. I made lots and lots of videos and films with them, and got them doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And in fact, yes, they've been in all sorts of bits of my work. Yeah, okay, I admit, <laughs> I lied. I forgot. <laughs> what about you? Tell me how how has it changed your your writing? Well, I mean, before I was ever a mom, I wrote mostly about heartbreak and the unhealthy relationships I was in. <laughs> so, um, I think as I found you know stability in my life, you know the things that were important to me. Um, changed and the messages that i wanted to leave out in the world felt a little different and you know the things that were on my mind as you see you know you know when you when you when you're bringing it like when you're raising a child in the world and you're like okay this there, there's something deeper about the idea of mortality and the end of the world and climate change like all the things that when i was younger were more of a periphery um, than a reality. And, um, you know, I just feel like the years that my son was born, it was like, I was pregnant when Trump was voted into office. I moved to California and then COVID hit and like, I'd experienced fires and earthquakes in a way that I never had. And so a lot of what I've been writing the last few years has been a little <laughs> darker and, um, you know, the, 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 the fear of death and what you leave behind being more of a thing for me. Um, but I'm hoping that changes. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, but maybe it just evolves as well. I feel very frivolous now, you know, me, I, I, the, my main concern was I could never do a handstand. So I really, <laughs> really to be able to do a handstand. And of course, you know, fear of, fear of the world ending. I, but you know, I, I I haven't um I haven't really integrated that in into into my work very much and I think that Honey and Lele are both now because Honey's now 22 so crazy when <laughs> they take on the world in such a big way themselves much you know and um I I I put my faith in them <laughs> I put my faith in the, the younger generation we <laughs> You know, I, I was involved in fighting lots of battles as I as I was growing up. You know, to do with kind of um, 
all you know homophobia and and uh, sexism and obviously you know rock against racism however white male it was <laughs> i remember uh, yeah i remember the first meeting of rocks against racism and uh, it was like a lot of white people, a lot of white men. And then we started Rock Against Sexism, and I tried to be involved in that, but the white men still were in control, you know. There you go. Um, but but we, did, we did fight for a lot of stuff, uh, um, and uh, really, really what, what was involved politically. It's, 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 it's so weird now because I do feel a bit impotent in terms of... Um, um, political activity you know I, I sign bloody petitions all the time occasionally go on marches but uh, it's not uh, you know I, I used to be on marches all the time but I'm not anymore I, I don't know what's going on but you have songs on your new record that go there I mean you have a pussy riot song on on your record and you also have a song about feminism um and you know just about like i feel like you're still very actively thinking and sharing your ideas and frustrations and your rage about what's happening in the world yeah. no i'm i'm definitely thinking and and uh yeah gosh you know i'm not, I, i'm <laughs> I paint about this stuff. I I, I write about this stuff, and uh, I think um, maybe my head's not in a very good. <laughs> my head's not in a very feisty place. I've been rehearsing for eight hours today, and I'm like, da di da di da. Nice time. <laughs> have a nice chat. I'm not um, I'm clued in. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think when the raincoats first started, we were. Um, we were an unusual uh, tribe, basically. I'd seen the Slits. They were the first autonomous all-female band that, I, that I'd heard about or ever seen. And they weren't, they had no man pulling the strings. They put themselves together. They were feisty. They were funny. They were crazy. They were, they were, cross you know they were they were they were beautiful and the the songs just completely spoke to me and that, and 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 I knew it was kind of part of a bit of a revolution you know it felt like things were changing things were shifting and punk felt like that in general but when I saw this like all female band I knew that it had gone like further and that I I really wanted to be part of it so when we when we became an all female band in the raincoats it was it was really really exciting and really thrilling and we knew that we were doing something you know interesting and good but we were also quite heavily criticized because we didn't we didn't look like they wanted girls to look we didn't sound like they wanted girls to sound so we kind of wound a lot of people up but you know in 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 retrospect you know that stuff has actually served us well because the world's caught up with us. But what 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 happened really, I suppose, is like, you know, I'm getting round to Pussy Riot. But what what happened was we we kind of stopped, and then when Riot Girl started in Olympia, Washington, they kind of said to us, you know, you were you and the Slits and we were a big influence on 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 us, and and uh, and that was really extraordinary for us. We were like. Oh my God! You know, there's it. It didn't all just die a death. It actually is. It actually has been kind of growing and growing. You know that. What's that saying? You know, they they tried to cover. They tried to bury me, but they didn't know I was a seed. You know, it's such mm -hmm. a phrase, really, isn't it? Because you know, uh, things things do get buried, but but. Uh, somewhere along the line, these things are growing, and uh, and and um, um, they're you know they're I don't know then they're, they're growing and they're nurturing and fertile or I can't think of any words but you know <laughs> and uh, um, so after that you know when when, when I saw Pussy Riot the, you know what 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 the raincoats did was we made little little steps you know. 
I remember at one gig in Birmingham, I think everyone in the audience emptied the po their pockets of lighters and coins and God knows what, and they all chucked things at us. We were like bombarded because they hated us so much. But, you know, the risks we took were pretty minor. And then with the, the Riot Girl girls, they, they were much, much more outspoken about feminism and they took a lot more risks than we did. And then the next level is the Pussy Riot women who really, um, you know, when, when you're fighting against uh, the church and Putin, you know, you're really um, setting yourself up for... Um, some big backlash, you know, and uh, so, uh, you know, I, th I think their bravery was astonishing. And, and, and there are lots and lots of brave w women around the world doing all sorts of incredible things that are far braver than anything I've ever been involved with. And, and I, 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 I do try to make work about some of those women because I think that's incredibly powerful. Basically, Anna and I were m much more countercultural, uh, probably Palmolive. But then Vicky joined the band, and she had been in a much more political uh, environment and in political bands. So when she joined the band, you know, she just she she was like, "Look, you may not think what you're doing is a a, a, a feminist act," she said. But you know, you're 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 writing your own songs. You've done you you're making your own artwork. You're very you're autonomous. You're doing all this stuff, and what you're doing is a feminist act. And we were like, really okay. You know, it's kind of like we were, we, yeah, we were we were countercultural. And Vicky came in and brought some politics, and and we were kind of. We kind of embraced it, but we, you know, we were we weren't a we weren't a political band, no. But but we were, but Vicky was a political person, and so, you know, when there's when one in four of you has that has that notion, and they're also writing songs. I mean, she wrote "Off Duty Trip," was a, which was about a a, a, a soldier. Um, on leave, raping a woman and getting off free for 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 committing the rape, as awful lot of men do. But you know, this was a soldier, so blah blah blah. Um, yeah, so so um, that was kind of a political statement. Um, mm -hmm. but I would say, yeah, more countercultural than political. <laughs> you know, as I've got older. I've got kind of more political in one way and less political in another, you know. Mm. So it's, it's, I do feel, you know, every generation, and you will find this, Sharon, <laughs> as Temba grows up. But, you know, Honey and Lele, are, there, there's a kind of young people, and you know this too, Michelle, only too well, that they have embraced something to kind of, attack the the older generation to do with language and, mm -hmm. and gender and so on and um you know that the way the def the definitions that you know we always saw a blurring of blurring of gender and a blurring of sexuality and you know oh yes we're all gender fluid and we, and you know if you talk like that to honey and lele you know you get <laughs> 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 yeah, it's. I, I appreciate their their passion and their need to redefine redefine language and redefine relationships and everything. I mean, you know, I, my parents drove me crazy because you know my my dad. You know, the patriarchy was for in full swing in my. <laughs> In my home, in my house, you know, um, my dad was in charge and my mum never wanted to cause any trouble and, you know, was quite depressed and unfulfilled, you know, and that actually was almost like a catapult, you know, I like I was pulling around and a boing, you know, I just, I just, <laughs> I'm just going to break out of this thing because I'm not going to be like that. What was your what what was your, the relationship of your parents like, Sharon? Um, you know, my parents they're 
they're, you know, they're wonderful people. And, um, you know, I grew up thinking that my dad um, was more liberal than my mother because my mom and I fought all the time. Um, but as I got older and I reflect, you know, and I'm getting to know them now as an adult, um, you know, my, my dad's much more conservative, but he was more of a rocker guy, stoner guy when he was growing up. So I saw that as liberal. Um, but my mom was, you know, she's a feminist and, you know, she's a spiritual person, but she went from being religious to more spiritual and studying, you know, studied Buddhism. And she was also a history teacher. Um, she wasn't, you know, a painter and she went from art to art history to history as she had children and went to night school as I was a kid. And by the time I was in you know, in sixth grade, she had gotten her master's and became a teacher after staying home for 15 years, raising five children. Mm -hmm. And so those things that I could not appreciate um, at the time and only saw, you know, my, my dad going to work and my mom being stressed out all the time just changed for me seeing what their dynamic is like. And they both work very hard in different ways. And I, and I understand, you know, a lot more as an adult where they come from and their roots. My dad's Irish Catholic. My mom was in a military family. And, you know, there's just so many layers of like what, you know, they came from and how it affects them now. But, you know, we're much closer than ever. Um, they didn't really understand my, my drive to do music. They knew I was passionate about it, but they always wanted me to have a backup plan. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Hmm? Nice job as a bank teller or whatever. <laughs> um, but you know, I understand that now too, because in a way, I I don't even know if I would be on the path that I've been on if I hadn't, um, you know, had jobs along the way and still figured out how to get, you know, jobs within the music world to understand better how the music world worked. And that's you know, what brought ended up bringing me to Bada Bing Records and getting an internship and learning as an intern and then going that way. But, you know, because they were like, you should if you go into school for music, why don't you go for like business? <laughs> and I was like, oh, I don't like this at all. And then I thought maybe I'll do production. And then I was like, you know what, I think I'm better I'm not good in the classroom. I'm good with my hands and I need to, I need to learn by doing, not by studying a book and hearing lectures on, on formulas that I don't necessarily um, subscribe to. Um, so meeting Ben Goldberg at Bada Bing Records was pretty life-changing for me. And it's because of him that I got turned on to this era of music. Cause I, you know, I, I, I was still learning a lot about, you know, indie music, you know, growing up with my, my family, it was lots of records and bigger shows. I moved away from home and I worked at like a DIY venue. And then I learned what touring bands were like, but then getting a job at a label with someone as specific as Ben Goldberg, who's, uh, he, you know, he turned me on to this post-punk era of music that just, just, changed my direction and changed like how I thought of songwriting and instrumentation and just, you know, the like the the rawness of a lot of the music I was hearing and reading about. Um, and I read this one particular book, Rip It Up. Oh, yeah. And it was around the time where I, I discovered like I just had just like heard Young Marble Giants for the first time. And that's when I heard you for the first time. And I was just I was, I was, yeah, it was, you know, it's like when, you know, one door closes, another door opens. And, you know, I felt like every time I learned something, another, you know, another thing was happening. And uh, that's not something you can really go to school for. And I, I felt like Ben would show me things as he saw that I was interested in it and just, you know, keep giving me records and recommending me books and in a way that I don't think I could have done at school. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I, I think all these, uh, commercial music courses of which I have actually taught a little bit on mm -hmm. you know I I know times are different now and uh people all seem to need to have a degree or something but going to university to study 
that and reading, you know, reading these books on philosophy or psychology or whatever they do. And that, that these kids, it confuses me. I, it's a whole other way of learning and being. And I, I think doing, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. Um, I don't know. Anyway, that's a bit but, of but you went to, So you went to art school pretty early on, right? I went to art school after school, yes, and uh, it it was it really did open my eyes because I I um I was quite a kind of mischievous teenager. I got I, I was I was very bored. I was very bored, and I kind of hung out with all the the baddies in the town because they seemed most fun and interesting. <laughs> so I, I I got up to a lot of crazy, got into a lot of crazy scrapes. Um, but it was only when I went to art school that I discovered my people. You know, suddenly I was in Trent Polly in Nottingham doing um, foundation and all the different art departments were there in the canteen and stuff. And I was like, whoa, this is amazing. And I discovered all sorts of things about art and all the different types of fine art, you know, land art, conceptual art, you know, all these different performance, all these different things that, just kind of excited me so much and and then I had all these new friends who were all kind of slightly offbeat in a in a brilliant way you know they weren't uh, that they they weren't like the people I knew before they weren't like the the local crims from Nottingham or or the or all the girls from Nottingham High School all of whom were lovely people you know but it was only when I went to art school that I really you know that thing kind of went whoosh and I was so excited by life um, I think, you know, up till that, I, I think I remember saying to my mum, this is the best year of my life so far. <laughs> Amazing. I, I loved the foundation year so much because you learn so much. It opens your eyes to so many things. Well, certainly a, 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 a woman, a, a girl of my age in that time, you know, many years ago, it was uh, it was it was the place to have your uh have your eyes opened as a as a kind of slightly uh, wayward young person. <laughs> you could feed all that energy into something exciting and creative, and uh, that was great. And then and then you do one year there, and then then I came to London, and I kind of fell into punk. I fell into you know the squatting scene. Uh, in in all I was in Alexandra Palace. There was a boy on my course who who knew I, I was I was looking for somewhere to live, and I, I moved into this squat in the middle of kind of all things groovy. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people today would find it really hideous because there was plaster was all falling off the wall. We only had cold water. I had two gas rings on the floor, and they were kind of slightly leaking, and. Uh, um, you know, there was nothing. There was nothing glamorous about it per se, but it was glamorous to me because it was so different and exciting. And but it was also yours, right? And it was your first place, and you had just left home. Yeah. And so that that part is pretty liberating, right? I mean, well, like ours, because it was like all the rich people had had evacuated from like Bayswater and Notting Hill. So it was full of squats and the, and the, and the streets there were squat cafes and loads and loads of secondhand shops and I suppose it was like you know Manhattan in the 70s you know it was it was kind of people talk about it being in a terrible state and it was in a terrible state but spiritually for us young people it was bloody marvelous you know it was bloody <laughs> Yeah, the community and the feeling on the streets. As you as you walked down the street, you felt like you owned the streets. Do you know what I mean? It was like this is this is my manor. This is my place. And uh, yeah, till a few Ted's arrived and we like Scarpa. <laughs> did you ever feel was it dangerous, or did because you knew everybody around there and it was mostly like artists and creatives that it was it wasn't that wasn't a thing. It didn't feel dangerous. I have this method that if I ever feel like I'm being chased or something, I, I start kind of loping and kind of trying to look a bit loony. And a bit mad. <laughs> oh, <I'm doing> that. <laughs> yeah. So, that was always my method. 
I never, I never know whether it worked or not, but I <laughs> so far touched with <laughs> I'm going to use that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, so my, I, I grew up in New Jersey, um, and my teenage years were in the suburbs and, you know, cul-de-sac community kind of thing. Um, you know, I had, I was lucky enough to be able to do musical theater and, um, and I, I got acoustic guitar lessons and when I was a teenager, but, and I did choir, but, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I had found myself by any means. Um, but it was my, my music teacher that told me about the school in Tennessee that had a recording program. And, um, that was the, the one thing my, my parents approved of was me going to the school because it had the backup plan. And so I, I went there um, in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, to Middle Tennessee State. And, um, you know, I, 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 I wasn't really enjoying school. And I, I think I was just too distracted by the freedom of, you know, being away from my family and just falling into going to shows and falling in love and like doing all the things without really caring about school. Um, and, you know, I'll shorten that story by just saying when I, when I realized that I, that wasn't the place I needed to be, I moved back home with my parents and then decided to move to New York, um, within a year of living with them. Cause I realized if I'm really going to pursue music, I have to be in the thick of it. I can't be on the outskirts of it because I am the kind of person that I need to be surrounded by other people that are busy, that are doing shit, you know, cause if I, I'm, you know, what I'm, I'm easily influenced by others. So if I see other people doing things or I'm inspired by what they're doing and they bring me into the things that they're making and the things that they're thinking, then it, it helps me get excited, but I, I wouldn't be excited in my parents' house. I couldn't get excited. Like, you know, commuting to New York, like every couple of days is quite, a, you know, an adventure in itself, but I think being surrounded in it was really inspiring to just see like everybody had more than one thing going on at the same time and you know new york is definitely the place that i'm i'm glad that i went and i lived for like almost 15 years what year did you arrive in new york um it was around 2005 or 6 <laughs> Aww. well i wish i could teleport over there and see your show tomorrow and um, I know that it'll be so incredible. Um, and I'm just so, I'm so happy for you. And I, you know, I I can't wait to <clears throat> play Denver your record because I was, you know, listening to it, taking notes and just, you know, just thinking about, you know, how, um, I don't know. I'm just so proud of you. I'm, I know it's big to, to try new things. And, you know, when you finally, when you have developed an, you're this thing and then you're moving on to another thing and I'm, I'm not being very articulate right now, but <laughs> um, it's a big, it's a big, it's a big thing making a record and trying something new. And um, I'm, I'm so happy. Well, that's coming from a person who's done all sorts of exciting and wonderful things and all your acting and, you know, that's been quite extraordinary, you know, being in that, uh, what's it called, the OU, is it? The OA. The OA, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, oh, it was such a weird show, but, you know, you got to keep challenging yourself, right? I mean, otherwise you just keep doing the same thing over and over again. <laughs> When you were filming that, did it feel like as weird as it looks when you when we're watching it? I mean, you know, I'm like in my underwear in like a cage, you know, being scared of a scientist who's um, doing uh, experiments on us because of our near death experiences. I mean, trying to conjure those emotions was definitely um, awkward. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I I learned that I'm not like I'm not, you know, I'm glad I was I'm glad I challenged myself to do stuff like that. But I, you know, I don't think I thrive in an acting environment. But I think for um, 
you know, writing process and improvisation and um, working with other people and having more of an appreciation for that field, you know, I'm, I'm glad I tried it, but I think, yeah, that is, that is not where I will pursue my endeavors. <laughs> well, it was a particularly, probably difficult, <laughs> possibly grueling experience. <laughs> yeah, so I had just taken a break from the band to go back to school and I had applied to Brooklyn College and had gotten in. And um, just as I had gotten like the acceptance letter, I got asked to audition for this show. And, um, you know, Zeke had convinced me to take a chance. You know, he's like, if, if the school will let you um, defer your enrollment to the next semester, you should take this opportunity and audition. And if you get the audition, you should just take it because, you know, he's like, it's an adventure. <laughs> And I remember thinking like, you know, it was a big deal to tell my band that I was taking a break um, to focus on school because you know, I'm still pursuing a psychology degree, but with all the other things, it's just chipping away. You know, it's like a class or two every, every other year, basically. Um, but, um, but, you know, I felt like I was kind of a phony if I was taking a break from tour to, you know, go to school and then I get sidetracked by acting. It just, it seemed like um, a silly thing to do, but Zeke, you know, uh, the constant adventurer um, and encourager, he was like, you can do both and we can figure this all out. And and so I, I did the thing and it was fun and challenging, but also like, you know, I went straight from that and, and, you know, deferred my enrollment and went to school and I really loved it. And then I went to go to a second semester, but I, that's when I found out I was pregnant. And so I was, you know, second semester of school, um, like, you know, seven months pregnant or something. And uh, so I got to do one, one semester before I had my child. Um, and so it's just lots of, you know, Lots of life getting in the way, but it was, you know, adventure after adventure, challenge after challenge. And, you know, took classes during, you know, during COVID as well, um, which, you know, was really inspiring as well. I took a sociology class and um, I, I found out about this organization out here called A New Way of Life, which helps formerly incarcerated women reconnect, you know, have a place to live and go to therapy, reconnect with their families, clear their records and get jobs and reassimilate to society and have like a support group within the houses they're living in. And it was started by this woman, Susan Burton, who has now opened 12 houses out here. And, um, and she um, is teaching other women in other countries, well, in other states and other countries and, and how to start these houses for women that are coming out of prison and having a safe place for them to live. And it was pretty inspiring. And this is an organization that I'm, I'm trying to partner with and raise money, raise awareness for as well as help them raise some funds along the way. Um, but still don't have my degree, but I've, I'm learning a lot <laughs> in different ways. Well, I, I, I started... I wondered if it was an important thing for you both to do at this point in your careers to do some to do things other than music. Gina, if you want to go. Oh yeah, well, I mean, I I've been doing things other than music all along, really. And but but about eight nine years ago, I don't know, you might probably know better than me, Michelle. When I suddenly <laughs> became obsessed with painting, and um, I just painted, 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 and uh, so that. That was really thrilling. And um, and then, you know, I'd have the odd uh, raincoats um, show. We'd be invited here or there, and we'd be played at the Pompidou Centre. We played in all different places. In fact, we played with Angel and, and uh, in, in Islington. Angel Islington. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh and that that yeah, we did the collaboration with with Angel for for uh, I think it was the Rough Trades um, anniversary. Um, um, so we had lots of different music things, but they were all kind of um, 
raincoats related, but we didn't really record any new music. So, so, but you know, little bits and pieces of doing music. But I, this is all a big surprise. This is this is the inter. This is the one that's kind of interfering with my painting rather than the other way around. If you know what I mean. Well, there's there's this lovely young woman called Evie Tar, and Evie works. Evie works for, she worked for Thames and Hudson. And she, um, very, very interesting, um, charismatic young woman. And she had this idea to kind of partner uh, lyric writers with visual artists. And um, she's a huge Sharon fan. Um, she, it transpires, she lives just down the road here. From <laughs> So funny. So she approached Sharon somewhere in America, wherever you are, Sharon. I'm never quite sure. And um, and then Sharon mentioned me, and because um, you'd seen some of my painting, and and I I I I we talked about me doing a kind of painted version of your amazing um, your amazing cover. It's so funny. Oh. When I see this record, I like I feel like I know every inch of it. <laughs> because I I've painted every little bit of it. And uh, right. but I painted it quite kind of literally, and maybe that wasn't quite what you had in mind, but um it was really enjoyable to do. And um Well, I'll uh, just say I loved that I love that painting, and the only reason it hasn't been used is because we didn't end up be make because we were gonna do like a like a rare like a demo version or deluxe version which didn't end up happening but hopefully it will one day and <laughs> i love that painting very much by the way <laughs> well wedding present when it happens <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's uh, and it might be on the cover of of the book um so i i i i interpreted or i don't know i made paintings that maybe relate to some of Sharon's lyrics and uh, so it's kind of almost like a bit of a collaboration they're like a little bit in conversation because they're not I'm not like illustrating the lyrics I'm just kind of making a painting which perhaps kind of slightly comment, comments on the lyrics or it's just... yeah, but we had that conversation I remember I, I like after I got off the phone it almost felt like I had a therapy session or something but you know you asked me to you know talk about like memories and meaning but then also just like images and colors and like you know emotions that came to mind and it was like I you know I was like I didn't realize like you know wh what you would use it for and in terms of your own inspiration but I was just like like I felt like I've get, I talked so much and I got so much out after our phone call that I was like hopefully she's not scared of me now um but yeah. And everything you made is so beautiful. And, um, you know, it's very, it's very emotive. And, um, you know, I know that they're not, you know, direct interpretations of my songs, but I feel like a lot of the feelings and, um, you know, sentiments are there, you know, and, um, and I, yeah, and I, I love, I love all of your choices. So <laughs> I'm excited to see it in, in real life. <laughs> It's quite small, isn't it? I'm like, <laughs> oh, we want it to be a bit bigger. Anyway. <laughs> well, I, I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I wasn't asked to prepare any questions. So I, I wish I had been. But I mean, you know, I, I, I um, we can just, we just chat and uh, I, it's, it's, it's really nice to know about you know but I, I'm really intrigued how you get on with this new process in your writing you know actually writing together with the band and it was interesting for me I've yeah, writing sorry I'm just going to talk about me again sorry um when when I came up with the the, the I gave li uh, the lyrics to youth and then he came up with the um guitar part and then I had to sing this in the chorus I used to wish I was you uh, and now you wish you were me, and 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 so I had this 
I I'd written on in, just off the top of my head that day. I wrote I wrote the lyrics, and and then that night I went home and I thought I can't sing that. That's such a weird thing to sing in a chorus. And so I, I then I I wrote these verses, which kind of completely undermined what was happening in the chorus. <laughs> and I took my and it's like they're terrible. No, not the. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just quite fun actually just kind of coming up with things on the spot and seeing what happened and so I think it's quite an interesting idea to go to the desert and oh, yeah. re so romantic going to the desert <laughs> just having discourse you know and I just like and after a couple of years of being so apart from everyone it was so nice like you said before to be in a room and to connect and and write in this way and to to perform and collaborate in this way where we're talking to each other we're bouncing off ideas it's a conversation you know it's not like you send an idea into the ether and you're just like i have no idea what i just did you know it's like it just felt much more more of an extension of our relationship to be able to do something like that that i'm still learning how to do and and as an you know as a writer but um yeah, I'm curious where it goes to. <laughs> How did each one start? Did someone come with a little riff or did you have some lyrics or how, how did you progress them? I mean, I, it, it, you know, once we got to a place, it was like I would have one person start something, you know, or if we were just messing around and I heard a sound, I said, OK, that is I like what that sound is. And then we would all focus, like hone in on whatever that sound was. And we'd all kind of fall into that. Um, and I would still kind of, I would still kind of direct, but you know, I would, I would let there be a free play before I started like conducting, you know, um, and my lyrics I'm still working on, like the lyrics aren't done. Um, but I have phrases that I've pulled and, you know, um i have to shape a little bit of like because some songs are just like jams so i'm like okay well i can't have an album of like 10 minute songs but like <laughs> you know these ideas and shapes and um you know like it's all there so now it's more of just like okay now how to what do i want to say like what are the you know i have a few i have a few songs that i know what i'm saying but then i'm like how does that affect the other songs and what do i want those to be did you record them on to digitally record them as mm -hmm. each a separate track? Yeah, so the the instruments can be separated for sure. Um, so I can, you know, we can chop them up and edit them or have a mixer come in and send me send me different mixes. I have, you know, roughs of them right now. And I can take my vocals out and be able to write to it if I wanted to. Um, do you use do you use a, a program yourself? Logic. Um, when I'm writing at home, I use Pro Tools, and I and I'll send it out to other people. But I'm not. I don't really. I don't get lost in it because I feel like I would. I would. I would. I would get. I would forget about the writing part and then just get obsessed with effects. And so I, I, I know it enough to like, it's basically like a four track for me and I can get my ideas in there and send it to somebody else, but I can open a session and someone else can help me with it. But I, I don't know a lot. You know, I try to keep it to like, you know, like a big, you know, I have like a basic knowledge of how to listen to tracks and record tracks, but without get lost in it though you can i mean you know i've spent hours and hours and hours in in there sometimes but i yeah i just use logic and uh yeah i know what you mean about just kind of you fall into it and you're not specifically i i wasn't really kind of writing songs so sometimes i would just have these loops and then these little phrases and then and then i'd come back to it a while later and it'd be like i was having a conversation with my with the the, the story I was telling in the song and then I'd come and I'd ask a question in a little vocal bit, like a kind of Greek chorus or something. And so, <laughs> do you think that, you know, so it's like, uh, <laughs> yeah, a kind of a conversation or interrogation. And it was, like, yeah, uh, it's, 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 it's interesting working with a band, but I, I, I've actually found it, yeah, quite interesting just doing it on my own at this point and, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, it'll be interesting to see if the two women I'm working with actually we end up writing together or 
well, how, how that works, yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I want to know how, like, how it feels to be up there with a new band and, um, you know, because wow. also, also deconstructing. Oh my God, this is a whole other conversation, but deconstructing like an album to perform live is like an art form in itself. Cause then you have to ask yourself, like, what are the most important parts for me? You know, I mean, cause you have a lot of dub influences on this record. So I'm curious, like how, you know, like when you, when you break it down to that level, is that what your show is going to be like? Um, well, there's a little bit of that. <laughs> uh <-oh. laughs> um but i don't know i'm uh but yeah that process is really interesting to me too just like what what are the what are the bones <laughs> i won't i won't bore you with questions but i had them just in case i got nervous <laughs> oh. um but it's so nice to see you both and uh thank you so much for making this happen and i'm so excited for you gina i love you so much <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I just, I just that 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 thing when you know, of course, uh, when when we met in 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 New York and you were pregnant, and I was like that that moment for me was just like such a special, special, special moment. I felt like because I, I you probably told loads of people, but I felt like we were like we we were really early to know that you were having going to have a baby. And I was like, mm -hmm. you know there no it was very early you were one of the first for sure <laughs> i don't even know if i had told my parents yet um but yes uh that was very early and it was such a special time and um uh, you know your 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 friendship means so much to me and your art <laughs> thank you uh, thank you bye. have a great rest of the evening yes. bye <laughs>